Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's DCNB CCNB seminar. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's uh, speakers. The first speaker is our own Dr. Margit Bermister. Margit is currently Associate Chair and Professor of DCNB, Co Director of Bioinformatics Graduate Program. She's also Professor of Psychiatry and Human Genetics and a research professor in the Molecular and Behavior Neuroscience Institute. Previously, Margaret received her PhD from European Molecular Biology Laboratory and University of Heidelberg. He was a postdoc fellow at UCSF. Her research interests are using genetic information to find the genes involved in brain disorders and then uh, dissect the disease process. Uh, our second speaker is actually Margaret's former student, Dr. Srajin Sun. Dr. Sun was previously an MD PhD student from University of Michigan. Following that, he did his residency at Yale. Dr. Sun is currently Francis Kenneth and Kenneth Heisenberg Professor of Depression and Neurosciences. Dr. Sun's research focuses on the intersection between genes and environment and their effect on stress, anxiety, and depression. Without further ado, let's welcome Margaret and Srenjin deliver the talk uh, titled Genetics and the Wearable Data Given Insight into Depression and the Stress. <laughs> Srenjin actually goes first. <laughs> okay. I had to like make some noise here. Well, yeah. No, I like it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. And thanks, Aaron and Josh and everyone. Yeah. Um, so let me, so yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Um, uh, we'll talk about uh, our study using um, uh, physicians and, and training physicians as sort of a stress model. Let me get to the first slide. Um, uh, uh, basically we're, we're trying to understand stress and how stress gets under the skin and, and um, leads to depression and, and using a few different modalities to get at that. Um, broadly, um, we know from personal experience this year and in general stress is, a, is ubiquitous and, and a real problem and it's the, the most important sort of possible um, precipitant of, of, of mental illness and particularly depression, but it's been hard to study and hard to study in humans because in general, it's hard to predict when stress is going to happen. Um, we usually don't know beforehand when we're, you know, going to get fired or, uh, you know, when a, when a pandemic is coming. Um, and, and, and as a result, we, we usually study it retrospectively. What we're using here uh, with these training physicians is a, is a relatively rare case where we can anticipate a group of healthy individuals will encounter stress and, and using that to follow it. So um, the focus is this group of people who um, just finished medical school. Um, we enroll them as fourth year med students and we follow them through their first year of professional training, intern year. So this is when doctors are first have you know real responsibility in the hospital. They're working 80, um, 80 plus hour shifts, often with um, inconsistent and insufficient sleep. And what they often report is that they feel like they have really important making life and death decisions, but don't have control or the knowledge to make it well, which, which is stressful for patients, but also for these physicians. Um, so we, we've been doing this study for uh, 13 years now um, and have enrolled uh, about 22,000 of these first year doctors over time um, from Michigan, but from um, hospitals around the country. And as Margaret will talk about um, even beyond the country, we first, uh, and we, we study them in a, in a variety of ways. So we um, enroll them uh, in the spring of each year. So um, in April and May, when they're in a low stress period of medical school and, and um, relatively you know, happy, don't, don't quite know what they're in for with their training, uh, we assess them with questionnaires. Um, we give them a Fitbit to measure uh, uh, some mobile data that we'll talk about later. and and then follow them through the years. They go through uh, with, with additional questionnaires, um, the mobile data, genomics, uh, and other things. So um, we measure a bunch of things, but the focus um, of most of the study is on depression. So we measure depression and depressive symptoms through uh, the patient health questionnaire, which is nine items derived from the 
the DSM, which is sort of the, the Bible of psychiatry and, and how we make diagnoses. Um, and the answer uh, on this scale and get a score between zero and 27, a scale of 10 or above has pretty good about 90% sensitivity and specificity for a, a clinician administered diagnosis of depression. Um, so before uh, the year starts, uh, about three and a half, four percent of these interns meet criteria for depression. Um, this goes up to about 25 percent um, uh, once internship starts in September and, and stays at about that level through this, the, the full stressful year. Um, Depression is an episodic disease and people cycle in and out of episodes. Um, we, we capture uh, an episode of depression in about half or 46 percent of the interns at some point during the year. So um, a pretty dramatic increase in depressive symptoms and there's parallel increases in anxiety, um, suicidality across a, a realm of, of mental health um, uh, outcomes. Um, it's, we're, not, we're certainly not the only ones to study this. There's been um, uh, uh, dozens of studies of this now. Um, uh, ours is the largest, but we, we've done meta-analyses of, of, of training physicians at various stages and, and essentially found results consistent with our primary study. Um, between 25-30% of, of uh, medical students and resident physicians meet criteria for depression at any given time. Um, uh, about 10, 12% have suicidal ideation at any given time. And this rate seems to be going up a little bit over time, at least over the course of, of 40 years that the, the, the residents training in the 2010s are a little bit more depressed than the ones in the early part of the century um, who are a little bit more depressed than the ones training in the 80s. Um, and, uh, and, and so it'll be interesting to see how that, that continues. Um, I won't go into this in too much detail since the focus of this talk is on the biology, but we've identified a, a whole bunch of factors that um, predict and associate with the level of depression um, during the year. Um, uh, both factors that we measure during, uh, during the experience and institution and residency program level factors and individual sort of um, traits that, that are uh, measured at baseline that predict uh, depression. And, and each of these, at least I think, has an interesting story behind them. I'll just go through one to give an example. Um, uh, one of the, the ones we've been focusing on, one of the most important predictors is, is gender. Um, before the year starts, um, men and women have pretty similar levels of depression. Uh, but during internship, women get um, more depressed than, than men, have, a, have a about 40% greater increase in depressive symptoms. Um, compared to men. And, and there, there seems to be a few different um, factors related to it. Um, but one of the most important that we found and, and that seems particularly relevant now is, is work family conflict. So this is the concept of work responsibilities, in this case, um, clinical duties in the hospital, interfering with family responsibilities and, and that leading to depression. And, and work family conflict, it goes up in both men and women goes up dramatically more in women. And this mediates a good proportion of the relationship between gender and depression that we see in, in the interns. Um, this work family conflict um, continues on beyond that first stressful year through the career of, of these physicians and early physicians. Um, and uh, the way the major way that we found that people are mitigating it, that, that, women, that this is falling disproportionately on women and women are dropping out of the workforce um, to, uh, to take care of the work family conflict. So we find that within six years of finishing training, um, about 40% of women have either stopped working or are working part-time, whereas uh, none of the men in our study have, have um, cut down on their work or, or stopped working. So a, a pretty stark gender difference there. Um, and even among the women who are continuing to work uh, full-time, um, a high proportion of them, um, uh, more than half, are considering working part-time. So, uh, uh, so this, this work-family conflict and the consequences have a, have a big impact on the physician workforce. We don't have nearly enough physicians, and, and this is driving um, a lot of physicians um, uh, away from work. Uh, as you might expect, this and the reason I brought that part up is, is this seems to be getting worse with COVID. Um, 
when we measured this cohort of, 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 uh, uh, of young physicians in, in August, we saw um, an increase in work family conflict um, and per, per, particularly among parents and um, the burden falling disproportionately on women physicians. You can see that they were more affected by loss of childcare. They're much more often the primary, um, uh, 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 primary source of childcare and, and responsible for household tasks. And, and we're seeing more and more women drop, drop out of the workforce. So this is a, um, a, a sort of current and acute crisis that could um, have, have uh, long lasting consequences for, for, for physicians. And likely what we're seeing here in physicians is true across other, um, profession, other for professors and grad students and, and uh, other professions. So um, following this out and, and, and seeing more broadly the effects of, of COVID and, and trying to do as much as we can to mitigate it will be important. Um, so uh, sort of talking about COVID, we, we we're also interested in how COVID would affect these, um, uh, going back to the interns and affect their mental health. I think there's a lot of reason to think that um, these, do these young doctors were already under a lot of stress and because of the um, uh, uh, increased acuity of patients, the lack of PP, um, some some high profile deaths that we've seen among physicians that that things would get worse, um, and we indeed we have a small cohort that Margaret will talk about in more detail in in China, and we did see in in early in the pandemic in January and February, um, you can see in red that their mood went down um, dramatically when COVID hit in China um, in a way that they in the previous year their mood actually improved with the with the Chinese New Year. Um, and we were expecting to see that in the U.S. Um, in our in our cohort of, of a thousand or so subjects that we followed during COVID, um, we saw that they did. Most of the interns were taking care of COVID patients and had close contact. A lot of them um, had to change their living situations because of the experience and um, had had close families or friends or colleagues test positive. Um, but we found um, this graph is the rates of depression on our study for all 13 years. Um, uh, and you could see that the, the rates of PHQ depression scores are pretty high. Um, all the way on the right side of the graph, that little shaded area is, is the period during COVID. And you could see that the rates of depression dropped really dramatically in the spring of this year, um, which is not, not what we expected, but, um, but a sharp drop. Um, when we uh, looked into it, um, sorry, um, uh, oh, sorry. Um, but the, we, when we looked into it more, um, uh, we don't have a, a great explanation for it, but it seems like it's a combination of factors that, that improve mental health for, for interns in this period. Um, the, uh, there's a sense of, of meaning that, that return to medicine, the sort of sense that healthcare workers are heroes. Um, and also there was a lot of uh, changes, administrative changes that were put in during, uh, during the COVID period that, that affected things. So administrative burden and the amount of documenting you have to do in the electronic health records and um, was, was cut down and people were actually spending more time with patients. So I think it's early days to figure out, figure out why, but this is, was an unexpected result and, and hopefully it can guide more about what, what is responsible for depression in this population and maybe more broadly to, to make changes going forward. Um, so that's sort of specific about, about these training physicians. We'll spend the rest of the talk using these, these physicians as a model to try to understand depression more broadly. Um, and one, uh, one question is sort of trying to understand how depression gets under the skin and affects, um, affects biology and affects our overall risk. Um, one way that we started to do that is, is with uh, telomeres. So these are, um, the, the, as, as most of you know, the, the caps on chromosomes that um, get shorter as we get older and has been put forward as a, as a, a sort of marker of aging. And, and telomeres generally get shorter at a, at a predictable rate, about 25 base pairs a year. Um, what we find in, in the interns is, is their telomeres shorten about 150 base pairs a year. So um, about six times as much as, as you'd expect in a normal year. Um, 
uh, and that that the the rate of their telomere attrition is is pretty closely tied to how how much they're working. So the interns that are consistently working seventy five hours or more had a uh, had almost a tenfold increase in their in their telomere attrition. So um, so this is concerning for the for the physicians, but also um, helps towards moving these telomeres and telomere attrition as a as a marker for stress and and might be a way to track track stress going forward. Um, we've also been working um, at the genomic level and and um, trying to use this model to try to understand the genomics of stress. So I'll take take us through a couple of examples. Um, the uh, understanding the variation of uh, the genetic variation underlying depression has been um, you know was what I worked on my PhD with Margaret on back in the day and and has been a sort of slow process. I, I think for in terms of GWAS, depression was lagging behind most other common diseases uh, pretty dramatically, but in the last three, four years, there's been real progress um, to the point I think there's now 170 loci that have been associated with depression through huge consortia of, of now uh, a million patients and, and controls um, out of 23andMe and the Psychiatric Genomics Consortia. But most of those studies have been um, pretty basic case control studies and, and haven't been able to delve into how the, um, how the genomic risk manifests in, in, in a phenotypic way. So we applied a polygenic risk score sort of summing across the, the 20 million loci and applied that to the intern sample. Um, here we see the, the po that polygenic risk score of depression on the x-axis. Um, the lower green line is there is the depression um, before internship in the low stress period. And the, the hot top line is their depression um, during internship. And you could see that the polygenic risk for, for depression is exists or, or manifests before in the low stress period, but is much stronger during this stressful internship period, whereas people where, where people with high polygenic risk scores get more, have higher levels of depression. And we can see this polygenic risk might be particularly good at picking out people who are resilient towards the left side of the graph, you can see people with very low polygenic risk um, have uh, very low and, and uh, almost never get depressed. So it, it can potentially give us, get us a sense of the genomics and the architecture underlying resilience to stress. Um, we're also, we can also look at specific types of stress or, str or particular types of parts of the environment. In this case, looking at um, social support um, so in, in this case, people tend to lose social support during internship, and that's um, uh, the, uh, in this graph that's on the on the x-axis, and depression again is on on the y-axis, and and you can see people with the light blue, people with low polygenic risk score, um, there as they get as they lose social support um, uh, towards the left side of the graph, their their depression goes up, but. The, the other group, the group with high polygenic risk score has a much dr more dramatic slope. So you can see in the, in the conditions of losing social support on the left side of the graph, they have, as you'd expect, higher, poly higher depression than people with low polygenic risk scores. But if you move to the right side under conditions of actually gaining social support, um, those people um, who we thought were at higher risk for depression are actually doing better that they're, they have lower depression than people with low polygenic risk. So it seems like in this, context, it's not actually polygenic risk, it's just a more, um, more sensitivity in the environment. And if you give them a good environment, in this case, a good social environment, they actually do better. Hey, um, Shreejan, could you just, yeah. what, I'm just kind of curious, uh, what, what measures of social support, like is it family or, you know, uh, how do you quantitate that to put it into a numerical scale? I mean, just you know, some exam yeah. example might be good. So it's a it's a it's a questionnaire. It's a multi multi um, uh, prong sort of questionnaire that gets at family support, but also spouse, friends, um, uh, other things, and and uh, so it, it broadly looks across all of them. And and um, so I, I think it would be great to get more granular and look which component might be most important. We we sort of. Um, uh, because sort of these sorts of genomic and particularly interactions are uh, often not replicated. We, we actually looked at this in another very different sample, the health and retirement study here at Michigan. Um, so these are older individuals. Um, uh, and, and 
in this case, the stressor we looked at was loss of the spouse as a, as the stressor. And we, we see the, the essentially the same sort of relationship that, that people with uh, the low polygenic risk score um, uh, had a change when, when they when they lost the, the social support, but, um, but it wasn't that dramatic. Whereas people with the high polygenic risk score um, did, did poorly when they lost support, but in, in the cases when they gained support, they actually did better than people who, um, who lost it. So, so it, it seems robust in that sense to the, the social support that, that is to, to your question, Brian, that interns have is probably pretty different than the social support that retirees have, but we see yeah. this effect with both groups. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. Sure. Um, and the other sort of major way we've been trying to um, use the intern model to, to understand biology and, and stress more generally is through mobile technology. Um, and Margaret will take us through most of this. Um, I'll just say that we, we've been, um, uh, so for all of our subjects for the past um, three years, we have them um, download and use an app that, that asks them on their mood, their mood every day and, and having them wear a Fitbit, which measures heart rate uh, uh, activity and sleep. And, and we're using that um, uh, both as an intervention that I'll talk about just a little bit, but mostly to, to track these, these factors in a granular way to see if we can predict stress and, and responses to um, different types of environments. So I'll just take you through um, uh, one or two examples and then pass it over. Um, this is sort of the daily mood score that we can um, track and we've been tracking for, for five years now. Um, and, and scores, uh, uh, in this case, of men and women. And um, we saw one day this, uh, as you can see on this graph, that had a much lower score than any other day we've ever seen in the study. And when we looked more, most closely, um, that was uh, November um, 8, uh, 2016, um, when, when Trump was elected. Um, and, uh, and when we looked more closely, we actually saw that the, the really low mood scores that we saw subsequently were related to public to political events and particularly events that were sort of favoring uh, the conservative point of view and the highest mood scores were were things that were sort of favoring the progressive point of view um, and and we saw that sort of carry over through from 2016 this was in um, BMJ uh, last year uh, in there they have sort of a satirical Christmas edition um, and and uh, carried through all throughout up, up until last year when we looked at it. So I haven't looked at the data yet from from last week, but but um, I'd be curious to see if anyone has any hypotheses of what the mood looks like. Yeah, you give us that printout Saturday morning at around ten thirty, Shrijan. What are you looking yeah. for? That? <laughs> it'll it'll be interesting. I think there might be low mood on uh, you know Wednesday and Thursday, and then and then an increase on Saturday. But we'll see. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, we've also been doing uh, a little bit of using uh, using this as a, uh, the mobile technology uh, for interventions, and, and particularly lately, doing these micro randomized uh, interventions through um, uh, through a grant from Midas. Uh, uh, so these are each day interns have a fifty percent chance of getting a message um, uh, related to their mobile technology. So uh, you know you can. It could say that you you know slept uh, six and a half hours on average last week. You usually sleep seven hours. Try to get more sleep. Or uh, similar messages related to activity or mood. And they also get this dashboard sort of showing their mood, sleep, um, circadian phase um, over time. Uh, so what we found is these messages can actually affect behavior and change things, but it 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 relates to their their state, their current state. So. Um, this is related to sleep, and, and that sort of sleep message that I went through um, actually affects people's sleep um, on subsequent days. But if if people are coming off a period of poor sleep, these sorts of sleep messages actually improve and increase their sleep in the coming days. But if they're in a period of actually good sleep, if they're sleeping eight hours a night and they get a message about sleep, that actually harms their sleep, and people sleep less than if they didn't get any message at all. So. Um, we find that the state the person is in is moderating the effects. So hopefully this will help us build and other groups build um, better and more targeted interventions to the, um, to the, per to the state that the, the person is in now. Um, so I'll hand it over to Margaret at this point to talk a little bit more about the mobile technology and other parts of the study. 
Um, Marie, uh, okay. You... Yeah, I'm taking over the. Uh, Great. That, let me just see. I think I'm now on mine. It looks just like yours because we discussed this. So, uh, as uh, Srijan was saying, uh, we, from the Fitbits, we will get sleep information, we will get step information, and from the uh, app, we will get mood information. So, how do they relate to internship? The first thing uh, that's clear is that bedtime uh, gets a little bit earlier during internship compared to pre-internship. Uh, I hope everyone can see my arrows, so that I that's my kind of pointer. Yeah, we can see them. It's good. The pre-internship, uh, the uh, post-internship. And of course, the wake time, which is something they cannot really influence. We will talk about that a little bit. Before internship, they uh, they sleep until you know somewhere between seven and ten, and before uh, after, during internship, it's shorter. And because uh, they cannot influence, they they cannot uh, accommodate by sleeping earlier quite as much. On average, they lose nearly three hours of sleep per week. Uh, during internship compared to the um, the internship the the other in, the uh, the internship time. If you look on the left, uh, this is comparing sleep and mood. And what you can see is, even though well, we can't we can't see, but the the math can calculate that there's actually a significant prediction of sleep the night before on mood the night after. So people who have uh, good sleep the night before have a better mood on, on, on average than people who had a bad night's sleep. And uh, the graph isn't shown, but there's a similar graph with steps having some effect. Uh, but but for example, something happened that uh, doing more exercise might make you sleep better. That was not significant. So we can correlate these uh, together. On the right part of this graph are, uh, is showing the in internships uh, PHQ above 10 is basically the classical criteria for having depression. So the yellow marks are always the hey, Margaret, I think interns that did get picture. depressed. Cut your picture because uh, you, you were having that internet problem. So we were having trouble hearing you. Oh, um, well, I can speak into the computer. Then I just have to stay. This is something. Um, can you hear me better now? We hear you so far good. OK. So uh, the yellow people are the people with a PHQ-9 above 10, which is a classical uh, depression criterion. The blue people are people who did not get depressed. And so the people who uh, get depressed sleep less hours. They are going to bed later. Uh, and uh, the wake time, but the wake time is not significantly different. But the standard deviation, how much variable there is, is significantly different. Uh, for the people who do get depressed. So to some extent, this says the sleep is predictive, is part of the picture of what uh, what causes the depression that Srijan talked about earlier. It's pretty clear that uh, bedtime and uh, length of sleep is part of the predictor of the, uh, of the uh, depression score. Um, what we... One idea that there, there are many other things we've done with, with the sleep, but one idea that uh, I had, well, about six months ago when uh, we changed to daylight savings time was to look into how can, can we use genetics rather than just the scores to predict how people's sleep react. And so what we ended, what we did is we took a study that just came out in 2019 that uses the midpoint of sleep as a way of measuring whether you're an early bird or a late uh, or night owl. And since we have genetics on lots of these people, uh, we calculated this uh, chronotype or sleep midpoint PRS uh, to, uh, 
for the interns. So this is not asking them, are you a night owl at any point? This is just using, uh, using the data and using the genetic data. So there are about 800 people where we have genetic data and can divide the interns into terciles. So we take the top thirds that are evening chronotypes, the bottom third, meaning where the midtime of sleep is earlier, the morning chronotypes and not showing the people in the middle uh, that are the average people. And then we use the data from the Fitbit to look at what happens during daylight savings time. And lo and behold, in the, if you look the evening after DST, there's a significant difference in how many minutes asleep people are. People do lose sleep when daylight savings times happen. Uh, when we looked then over the next week, that's shown on the right, um, then what we can see is that there is a difference between the people that are evening people and people who are morning people. So the evening people are the ones that lost the sleep, that morning people actually did not lose sleep, which makes sense because they are naturally inclined to get up earlier and the daylight savings times made them get up more, even earlier. So when you look through this, you can see that the blue, the morning people and the uh, red, meaning evening people based on genotype are different. And even the Saturday after daylight saving times change. So this is just the one hour, chi hour change. You can still clearly see a difference between the, uh, the Saturday before daylight saving times was changed and the Saturday after daylight sa saving times was changed, whereas the people that are more um, morning people have completely adjusted. Their sleep schedule is the same the Saturday after the change has happened. So we think uh, that the this is just one example of a time switch. So basically some people may be genetically uh, may, be, may, may react genetically different to different time changes. Um, it, we don't have the data shown, but in the most recent uh, type of time change, so from uh, daylight savings to back to standard time, there is not much of a difference. So the overall, the, it's, it's not as clear. But the early morning, and it's also true in like traffic accidents and what you hear in the news, it's usually the daylight savings time start that is causing problems. And what we are saying is it causes problems, particularly for those people who have a genetic score, the polygenic risk score, a polygenic score that makes them more like uh, evening type people. So that uh, has, has a little to do with mood, but may have to do based on the previous slides uh, ultimately. So that's another uh, piece of work that I don't have slides on. Song is working on actually depressed and who does not get depressed. Now I want to uh, switch gears because most of the data we have shown in the last part, the uh, parts with the polygenic risk scores, were based on European American because these polygenic risk scores in, in depression have so far only been used in, uh, in European Americans. And so we could only calculate them for, poly for European Americans. And what this is showing is the uh, blue people here are the European Americans, which are about 59% in the intern study. And there are the light blue colored uh, people, which are Asian. So if you look at that, this is by far the largest non-Caucasian uh, group in the study. And if you take Asians, so the, these are probably uh, East Asians and these are South Asians. And if you look at Asians, the association that Srijan talked earlier between the mood PRS and PHQ-9 score, where we saw an effect on resilience, if we do the same on individuals of either East Asian ancestry or South Asian ancestry, we do not see any association. So this is something that uh, I think we as a, as a department uh, need to keep in mind. Uh, this is a, another part of sort of structural racism in, in, in medicine in that 
in genetics, all our data are mostly based on Caucasians, and we cannot use those same data to predict uh, the same phenotypes in Asian or South Asians. And so what we did is we collaborated uh, with a group in China. Uh, in part, this was funded by uh, the Shanghai Jiao Tong University uh, Joint Institute. In China, I only want to point out this part here. In China, uh, students after high school do, if they want to go into medicine, do a medical medical bachelor that takes five years, and some start residency training right after that. So uh, the Chinese uh, residents are usually two to three years younger than the uh, American residents because in, in America, it's an eight year program, four years of undergrad and four years of medical school minimum before you do residency training. There are other paths through the master and a PhD in China. The other big difference in China was that in contrast to the two to three months between the end of medical school and the start of residency, this sort of relaxed period that Sregent was talking about. In China, that transition time is only about two weeks. It varies a little bit from person to person. It has to do with when they decide uh, to go in and so on, but it's definitely not as long as that. And so we basically try to replicate uh, the study Sregent was describing in three years in Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And uh, I will just give the summary of the slide. So what this is showing is that China is, on the, is in red, the US is in blue, and the diagram is very much modeled to the one that Sregent has shown now twice, which is how what percent of people uh, get depressed. So at the outset, Sregent was saying three and a half to four percent start depressed. Among the Chinese, the outset is much higher. It's about eight and a half percent. And there is a similar increase during residency during the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter. But the degree of increase is, uh, is about the same. So we see definitely see this increase and the um, difference in the very beginning may well have to do with the fact that they are not having a, as long of a, as a, a period where they are relaxed as in the US. And when we are asking who fulfills criteria for depression at least once during all of the residency, the number is actually the same. So in the US, it came out to 34.9% and in China to 35.1%, and that was not a significant difference. So we, we definitely can replicate in China this increase during residency, even though the system and what kind of schooling they have before is very different. Now, Srijan was mentioning some of the factors that are predictors of uh, depression changes and uh, some of the factors that are very well established that he had on his slide but didn't talk much about is, for example, the uh, neuroticism. So a high score of neuroticism before you go into residency is a very significant predictor of depression afterwards. It's the most uh, predict, uh, strongest predictor here, uh, maybe in addition to well, having had depression before. So personal history of depression is also very, very high. Um, other predictors are early family environment, the baseline depression symptoms, being female as Regent was talking about, although that is going is, is not as strong a predictor. Stress for life events is a predictor, but these are all significant predictors. So which of these are in common with China? To our very big amazement, neuroticism, which is very well established as a factor, did not predict depression in China which is, uh, and if anything, the effect was in the opposite direction. So it's, it's definitely not a power issue. In fact, uh, to, uh, to go into the issue of power, we also looked at East Asians in the US sample. And in the US sample, uh, neuroticism does predict depression. So it's, uh, it's actually not the heritage, it's whether you're a resident in the US or in China. Early family environment was not significant in China. The baseline depression symptoms were the same, but uh, gender marital uh, factors were not giving an effect, even though they were giving an effect in, in the US. And all of these factors were the same 
when we look at the US, US born Chinese or the, uh, the US residents of East Asian heritage, they were all much more similar to the US. The one thing where the Chinese were significant and the US were not is age. And it was basically um, that uh, what I said uh, earlier when I talked about this, the, those students who went into residency uh, two, two to three years younger than in the US, they were more likely to get depressed than Chinese residents who had gone through a master or a PhD and were a bit more mature when they went into residency. Whereas in the US, there was no difference uh, between uh, of age uh, in there. So uh, this, as I said, we, we, all, we really need as a community to increase the number of studies of uh, genetics in non-Caucasians, uh, and this has actually been recognized by NMH among many other agencies as well. And so there was a call to study genetic architecture of mental disorders in ancestrally diverse population, which was a program announcement from a clinical psychologist from Brazil that, who works with three, uh, uh, led with me a, a grant application the in a, in a very large okay, you're scale. going in and out again Margaret okay well that that's <laughs> I'm nearly done anyway I there's not nothing better I can do uh, I, I guess I can you said you I could try to take my picture out let's see how can I do that I think it's fine, Margaret. You were, it was when you were moving back and forth. So I think it's you. Okay, okay, okay. That's, that's why I usually prefer doing the, um, uh, doing the headphone. So Brazil is an amazing country in terms of admixture and in terms of different populations. So to contrast, the current intern health study has about 4% uh, uh, self-identified Black individuals, 4% self-identified Hispanic individuals, and 8% admixed, and most of the admixed are Caucasian Hispanic. Uh, they are very, very, I think it's less than 1% Native Americans. In Brazil, uh, our expectation is about 39% of African ancestry, 30% of mixed admixture, and per definition, basically, they are either all Hispanic uh, or, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the definition of Hispanic. And it, there are papers saying that even in Brazil, people who, who are white and who self-identified as white, more than 50% of them actually have admixture of various degrees in there, although I don't know what the number would be in, uh, uh, in the US. I'm sure there are also some in the US like that. Uh, and so in summary, and uh, Srijan is welcome to add to that summary, what we have seen is a dramatic increase in depression with medical training. There are effects on the physicians and patients. One thing that Srijan has shown before that he didn't mention, but since patients is mentioned here, is people who get depressed during residency also are more likely to commit medical errors, and that, of course, affects patients. There are positive and negative impacts uh, of COVID-19 on uh, depression and on residents. The effect during residency is global. There are, we have done studies in China and are planning, uh, and Karina has studies has done studies in Brazil, and we are planning to do the, the whole scheme of Fitbit and genetics there. There are many different factors involved, and some of them differ between different populations. And uh, I, I think uh, Sri didn't talk about the tailored interventions uh, today. Um, but the, these having all these factors on the Fitbit and from the mood actually really can be useful to to help uh, identify what can be changed in order to uh, to uh, mitigate these stresses. Um, well, thank you. I think this uh, is where we are right now. Um, the this is uh, Srijan's work is funded by an R01. We have a UM Midas grant together and a UM Shanghai Jiao Tong University uh, Joint Institute together. And Srijan is uh, funded also by the
the Taubmann and uh, AFSP and Pritzker. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I think All right, that's great. I can stop share and then we can see each other's pictures, right? But I can share again if you want us to go back to a slide. So do we have questions from the audience? So you can just unmute yourself and ask a question directly. Yeah, I've probably asked you guys this 10 times. I mean, have you, th have you thought about doing a study uh, with graduate students, you know, and pre-candidate, candidate, afterwards, you know, postdoc? I mean, you know, I'd love to see that one. What well, do you we think would happen? We have been talking about a study in, in undergraduate students, and that may well start in some form. That was initially funded by the Bioscience Initiative just when they were about to want to fund it, COVID hit, and they were not allowed to fund us. But we are now uh, going to go ahead with that in some form. So that's grad, undergrads. Have you thought about grads? Yes, yeah, undergrads. Yeah. It would be great. And I think there's there's some evidence, I mean, there's yeah, the good evidence that the rates of depression are pretty similar among grad students. I think the, um, so it would be great to do. I think it's a more um, heterogeneous experience. Yeah. Uh, depending on the, um, you know, different graduate programs, how the research goes, your mentor and things like that. So, um, so I think in, in some ways it's, it, that makes it more interesting, but also requires more power. But I think that would be great to do. Yeah, I, have, I, have, a, I have a question. Um, a very, very nice presentation. And um, uh, I, uh, with regards to actual treatments, hospitalizations and sort of, in, you know, kind of interventions, uh, that uh, uh, what what are the data uh, around that? Um, for this for this population, mm -hmm. uh, it, it uh, yeah, thanks. Good question. Um, uh, so the the overall level of depression is not is is as I as we mentioned a lot uh, a high proportion meet criteria, but the level who of the severe depression, sort of a PHQ above twenty two, is relatively low. And the number of hospitalizations is low. Um, uh, that said, there there are some that do, and, and suicidality is, is relatively frequent. Uh, probably because of stigma, the rate of treatment is 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 pretty low. Um, when we measured it closely, uh, it was about fifteen percent of those depressed who got treatment about um, eight years ago. Um, it's so actually fifteen one five one five with okay. With Sort of so 80, 85% didn't. Yeah, but that's actually gotten better and that's gotten down from 85% to about, I think, 65% in recent years. So it seems like the proportion of people who are depressed who get help has been going up um, in recent years, maybe because stigma is going down. Uh, so we, we asked, when we started the study in China, we actually asked the, the residents there what they would think about the study. And a very large, I mean, a very strong sense came that this is a problem in China too. We would not trust giving these data to our university in China. We would trust if you say that it goes to some server in, in, in America. And they said they, I, I don't know if you call that stigma or how do you call that? They just would not trust their own institution to treat them. And just like here, I think it's, they would have to go to their own institution for treatment. And so they were basically saying, I would have uh, a, a career, it would have career uh, impl implications if we were to, to talk to people at our institution. And so they universally said, no, we would not ever see a doctor about that because uh, we don't want to get fired, basically. Uh, so with a, with a large number like that, with 22,000, uh, do you know um, any really bad things have to suicides and you know things like that statistically you'll you, you'll hit those or do you have any and do you have any like a all call or any more the mortality rate for any reason yeah great question i um i think statistically we'd expect something in the um you know um appreciate like 10 to 20 suicides 
um, given what we know about the general population rate and this, this. So um, we don't have that yet, but I, I'm trying to work with the um, National Death Index data mm -hmm. to see if we're, if we're able, it's not clear to me yet whether we'll be able to match up with the information we have, but uh, that's a great idea and took a, uh, yeah, you came up with it much faster than I did. Um, it, it would it would be good to, to be able to look at that and I'm hopeful, but, but I'm not. Confident. We've, we've had good experience working with the uh, national death index. So we just, we've been working with them. We've not gotten a huge amount of, of, uh, you know, things from them so far, but you know, with that, <clears throat> you can get the death, the death certificates and, you know, and that. And so. Right. So um, I mean, typically yeah, they, the, re the response is when you send an email to them and the family will contact you and saying that, uh, that that was the other question. In, in terms of you know, you're getting into the six six years, uh, you know, downstream with that. How, uh, the um, response rate. How how are you? How is that? Uh, main. How, how is it going? Maintaining the response rate. Um, it's about. Uh, so we 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 haven't been following everyone um, beyond intern year. Um, um, uh, as in. You know, we followed about the 22,000 during intern year, but only about 800 or so from the early cohorts, from the first three cohorts um, uh, annually. The response rate is about 60% for those guys, but mm -hmm. um, and 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 they're you know they're they're getting into interesting parts of their life. So I'd love to study them more. We haven't had specific funding for that part of the study, so. Um, so that's why we've restricted it to that 800, but it, it, the response rate's been okay. Um, and we've been putting in some effort to make sure we have a, a valid email address and, and physical address for them. And, and they seem, particularly during COVID, they seem, you know, eager to take part and tell us their experiences. So, um, but, but yeah, as they, as they get further in their career, I think they'll get even more, more, more interesting. So I, so, you know, I'd love to continue following that annual cohort. Thanks. Thanks for the great questions, Melvin. Great work. Thank you. Okay. Other so thoughts or ideas? And yeah, we're definitely open to other ideas and di directions. So if people have, have thoughts, please share. Oh, may I ask another question? So, so for sleep, I know for human sleep, there is different stages. Like there is one special stage it's called a uh, rapid eye movement, like a REM stage and non-REM sleep. So I, I, I'm not an expert in this area, but I heard, so the REM stage is a recover for the neurons for your brain and the non-REM is for recover of the body. So I wonder in your research, is there any way to collect this REM sleep or non-REM sleep? I feel probably the REM sleep is more related to depression. So. I'm not sure if there are any like uh, people expert on sleep disorder on your team or any ideas. So I think I asked something like that before in lab meeting and uh, the, the Fitbit gives that information only fairly recently, like in the last one or two years. So we have to wait a little bit to get really good data on that. But uh, if you have one of the newer Fitbits, you have that information of, of what is the Fitbit score, how much REM sleep, how much deep sleep, and so on. And so, yeah, that, that might be possible because that's part of the data that we, we would get. Okay. Yeah, so I think that's right. And there's uh, uh, sleep experts could um, quibble with the, and reasonably quibble with the, the how validated the Fitbit measures of REM and non-REM sleep are, but um, yeah, but we don't have. That's what we have, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do we have more questions from the audience? I like you guys to have an idea because like this DST was an idea I just had because I felt it and I said, oh, we have the data, we might be able to analyze it. There may be other ideas out there that we have the data for, so let us know.
Okay, I think that's all for today. Thank you so much, Margaret, answering. <laughs> Okay, thank you for having us. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. It was great. <laughs> Bye. Thank you guys. Okay. Nice.